thank you, comrades, sisters, brothers, uh, especially uh, giving up time on a on a on a Sunday evening. Uh, and apologies for running a bit late. I've just come from another event, and uh, in the last few days, I've actually, just also been in Stockholm to mark the Stockholm Plus Fifty uh, Fifty years since. Um, the anti-colonial movements, the new governments of the global south, uh, together with the growing uh, awareness uh, of the ecological crisis in the global north, created this, what was then quite an incredible conference that for the first time linked uh, the environment, the economy and human well-being. And uh, we'd say, of course, where we are now uh, is a waste of 50 years. but. I think we can all agree, and 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 listening to that introduction about the framing, that this is in a time of incredible injustice and and anger, and of monsters. But I also want to spend some time uh, uh, saying that it's also a moment moment of incredible hope. Right? So, and of course, you know, when we see and we think about terms such as environmental breakdown, and we all know this is not a a, a crisis in its own silo it's connected to all of our other struggles from the economy to conflict human well-being human rights etc and and i think we've all been struck of course by just how the world looks at or how the global north and the richest countries look at different crises and uh, we can see that of course even through how the lens of of uh, uh, Putin's illegal invasion of Ukraine, right? Those images of war crimes, of course, mirror the experience of many people around the world facing the ongoing reality of occupation and war, be in Palestine, Eritrea, Yemen, Syria, etc. And, and it was a moment which should have brought home the importance of human solidarity and respect for human right, the law. But we saw it, of course, in, viewed through a lens that's a, that even had mainstream journalists talking about, well, they look like us, they're white, they're civilized, they're worthy of protection. Um, whilst those in the global south were routinely, routinely dehumanized as if war was a natural state for this uncivilized third world. And I think we're all struck very, very clearly about, and absolutely right that the borders in Europe were open for those fleeing in Europe, but that it was barbed wire and fences for those fleeing the wars that the West fuels everywhere else. And um, and you know, many people have even talked about Ukraine, of course, through the lens of, of fossil fuels. You know, so this is a, a, a war financed by fossil fuels, and we know that many other wars, including the illegal war on Iraq, um, were either about control of fossil fuels or have been fueled by fossil fuels. And uh, the response of our own government and of many Western governments is, of course, is not to see this moment as a movement moment to shift away from fossil fuels, but simply to say, well. As long as the fossil fuels are from dictators we like, then that's okay. And it's our dictators that matter. And again, um, we saw Boris Johnson going off to Saudi Arabia. We've seen uh, President Biden uh, doing the same in the in the coming days. Um, as Tony said, look, I think when we look at this crisis, we have to see it as a within the context. It's a world shaped by an economic system, right? And if we had time, we would spend. I'm happy to go through, you know, this genesis of high through from slavery to colonialism, imperialism to today's neoliberalism. It's constructed racialized capitalism that calculates that there are always people in the world that can be sacrificed. Um, and those historically have been, of course, the global south. Uh, so the sacrifice zones are not geographical. They're actually a state of mind in the pursuit of profit. But now increasingly, we're also seeing that happen to the poor, in, 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 including here in the UK. And it's created, of course, a world riven with deep inequalities and injustices. And nowhere is that more apparent than, of course, the climate crisis. And as Tony mentioned, that we've just recently had three of the IPCC, which is the International Panel on Climate Change, the world's climate scientists, produce these uh, reports every five years, and they've produced the report. And as the UN Secretary General himself said, that this report was a damning indictment um, of climate leadership. But it also showed that incremental siloed climate action is failing, and that this delay means death. And, Every second counts and every degree matters in this. And, you know, I'm originally from Pakistan and we've had heat waves currently uh, hitting 51 and 52 degrees in Pakistan. Uh, you might have seen pictures today of 
the predictor 50 degrees across now Iraq, Iran, and the Middle East. We've seen killer floods, fires, famines in pretty much every corner of the world. And, and of, of course, we're not all in the same boat when it comes to those who are responsible for this crisis, those who are being impacted now, and those who will be impacted in the future. And I so, just want to maybe say something a little bit about you know, what those reports were saying about the urgency of, of action. Now, um, many years ago, we, as the social movements of the Global South, um, we fought for temperatures to be limited to less than one degree, already pointing out that the rising temperatures were not just affecting ecosystems, uh, food production, creating uh, extreme weather events, but were also causing huge economic uh, damages for, for countries in the Global South. And um, you may remember um, a, a couple of years ago, that that's the storm in Mozambique, um, a, a one cyclone. And when that cyclone hit Mozambique, it destroyed uh, a major port city and it left a million people on the brink of starvation. But the, they were on the brink of starvation, of course, largely because the, the the government of Mozambique was literally unable to be able to act to defend its and protect its own citizens. Uh, in fact, the Mozambique government had to come here to the city of London to, to beg for more debt creating loans. Now, uh, compare that with, of course, those pictures of flooding that we saw uh, a hit in Europe uh, last year. Um, well, the German government allocated 30 billion euros to be able to deal with the with the impact of those floods and so the difference and the disparities between not just the scale of those extreme weather events but the ability of governments to be able to respond to them so when a storm hits dominica in the in 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 the caribbean it wipes out it wiped out 10 years of development gains um that's every single public building school road etc and, and of course plunging many of these countries already into greater Poverty. Now, the IPCC reports said three and a half, 3.6 billion people are already highly vulnerable to the cl to climate change. And and when we, if we overlaid the climate crisis with uh, any other uh, uh, data, we'd see that it was the same half, half the world who are vulnerable to the climate change. They're the same half the world who are already locked into poverty. These are people who are living and surviving the equivalent of five dollars fifty a day. Now, that's not what not on five dollars fifty, because the way poverty and the, these figures are, are calculated, it's what the purchasing power of five dollars fifty in the US is. So if you know how, what little it buy in, in, in the US, that's how much um, the, the world is locked into poverty. And if you're interested in terms of what you're talking about, the upper level of poverty, you need about to tackle it, you need about $10. If you wanted people to actually live with some basic dignity, we'd be talking about the equivalent of $15 a day that is needed. Now, that same half the world are also without access to electricity and clean cooking. The same half the world that we're in that, without access to public services. Two billion of those people are going hungry, not because we can't feed people, but because our food system is controlled by corporate giants. We've got 1.6 billion people without adequate housing, yet the richest 10% of the world, uh, the, the same 10% of the world who are responsible for double the emissions of the poorest half of the world, are of the same 10% who have captured about 80% of global wealth. And, just illustrating of this how how wealth and our economy is such an imp important lens when we think about environmental breakdown we all know that over this last year for example just in this one year the world's billionaires there's about 2800 of them saw their wealth increase by a, 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 their wealth increase by about 16 trillion dollars at the very same time as the wealth or the wages of the poorest uh, workers in the world uh, decreased by about 13 trillion dollars uh, and we know that of course you know climate is not just as an injustice in itself in that those who are the least responsible are the most impacted and those most responsible and are the least impacted it it amplifies all of these other existing injustices that are baked into our system. Now, we all know that there is a clicking talk of the climate crisis, and we have a very, very rapidly closing window on 1.5 degrees. Now, the IPCC reports have set out in great detail 
that many of our ecosystems are already on the point of no return and that these are the critical ecosystems which underpin the lives and livelihoods of the poorest people and that's everything from access to fresh water to food production and that these impacts which we are seeing now around the world are just happening at over one degree 1.1 degree when they happen at 1.5 we get what is called you know we'll we'll get start to get into what is called runaway or catastrophic climate change where we'll start to have feedback loops and at those impacts those are going to be irreversible and as you just heard, we're currently heading towards a warming of at least 2.7 degrees. With, and, and that's if every government and if every corporation does what they've been promising to do. And as we know, what we've, we've seen in the last uh, decades is that none of those promises are being, are being met. And in this year, we're going to emit more carbon emission than we've ever emitted in human history. And at the same time, you might, when you walk down the tubes or anywhere, you see all of these posters of corporations, including now fossil fuel companies, everybody saying we're going to be at net zero by 2050. And I just want to say something about very briefly about this word net zero. So the whole idea of net zero is basically that you calculate to overshoot this 1.5 degree threshold, uh, you overshoot it, and then at some point in the future, you try and dial back temperatures through non-existing unproven and risky technologies to try and suck carbon out of the atmosphere now uh, none of us of course would accept public policy uh, if it had the you know over 66 percent chance of it failing right we won't get on a, a bus or a train but that's exactly what all of this public policy around net zero is trying to is, is basically doing and that's before we even get into the into the the the, the that the only technology that is available is bioenergy and that requires a landmass three times bigger than the continent of india and i think all of us would know if we were suddenly had this empty continent sitting somewhere uh, three times the bigger in india that we could use for bioenergy and of course what's going to happen if, as we've seen consistently happen is that there will be uh, it will be the poorest land that will be affected and i want to just say something also very quickly about food because if you've been paying attention you'll hear now increasingly warnings by everybody from the un the world food program that we are heading into a food pandemic food crisis that this is uh, we're seeing the collapse of our food systems now some people say oh well that's also only because of what's happening in ukraine um whilst of course Ukraine has affected wheat production. Actually, the reality is, is that the majority of the world, something close to about 80% of people, are fed only on about 20% of existing agricultural land. The rest of the land is controlled by uh, uh, large corporations, by industrial food systems, and they're geared towards producing well, commodities. So they produce livestock feed, which then feeds the, feeds the food, the, the dairy and meat industry, or there are other commodities such as, as palm oil, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so we are in this moment of not just of one crisis, but I would argue a permanent crisis of, of these insected from economy to climate, and we've seen it, of course, racial and, and, uh, and, and gender injustice and social and economic justice. And of course, that's all rooted in this, model of the of the world that has been constructed uh modeled we would argue in in that in that framework of colonialism now um and unsustainable and inequitable growth um now it, it's always interesting that when we say these frames and been saying them for a long time saying to really understand these crises, you have to understand the root causes, you have to understand the structure and then suddenly you have the ipcc these world climate scientists saying exactly that saying that the reason why there are vulnerabilities in the world today is because of historical patterns and, and systems of injustice including colonialism which need to be addressed if we want to ensure that everybody can uh, uh, has the right can can both address the climate crisis and of course have the right to live with with dignity now we have a world where the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer and whether we, minutes, okay whether we're from vaccine apartheid to economic apartheid to climate apartheid we see that the reality now absolutely i uh, i don't think we're angry enough but people should feel angry uh, at the failure of our governments and big business who are determined to protect this economic system but I also want to maybe just spend a couple of minutes on 
we should also hold, we should uh, at this moment hold a, a hope of change as well. Now, it's Antonio Gramsci, the Italian revolutionary, described it perfectly, right? The old world is dying, the new world struggles to be born, now is the time of monsters. And it really does feel like a time of monsters. Authoritarian leaders, stoking division, wasting trillions on wars, unwilling to save people, planet, when we know what needs to be done. But it's exactly at this moment where these principles that we all share of universalism of humanity, the belief that ordinary people coming together, that we have the power to change the world through our, act, through our collective, collective action, is really, really important. And that hope rests on us speaking the truth. Now, as War on Want with our partners, we've been working on a vision of a global Green New Deal, a radical global Green New Deal that says we can't give up the fight for 1.5. And that does mean rich countries doing their fair share of action. And if you want to know, as War on Want, we did a study on what would be the UK's fair share of action. Well, we would be at minus 200% by 2030. That's how much carbon we have emitted and our responsibility. So not only would we need to be at real zero by 2030, we'd actually need to give a trillion dollars to the global south to be able to, for them to do the action that we're no, no longer able to do. And that's without talking about anything about the historical injustice of, 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 of wealth extraction. Uh, again, from the India subcontinent, you probably know this figure, when the, when the British went to uh, India, you know, India's share of the global GDP was about 24%. When they left, it was less than 4%. And the UK had taken out about 48 trillion out of India alone. And that's without the rest of the colonies. Yes, we have to fight to end fossil fuels and those fight, 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 that finance them, but actually we need to go beyond that because what we need to be now talking about is the right of everybody to have energy. So that means equitable access to publicly owned renewable energy systems so we can address both energy poverty and the climate crisis. Look, the IPCC says we need a new social compact on, on climate and poverty. And to be able to do that, again, really interesting that every demand that we have long made, whether it's about universal public health systems, living wages, workers' rights, land rights, the right to food and energy, the right to decent housing and health, the science reports are now saying those are the key adaptive measures. So if you want to solve poverty, you need them. If you want to solve climate, they're the same demands. If you want to solve inequality, they're the same demands. And it's exact same moment that our call, whether it's cancellation of global debt, wealth taxes, fixing the, the rigged economy, become really, really important. And, and if there's one thing that the last, this war on Ukraine has shown us, is that all of our demands that we have long made and we were told were never possible, and now real possible because if you can seize the assets of russian oligarchs then you can seize the assets of the billionaires if you can put sanctions on the russian fossil fuel companies then you can put sanctions against other energy dirty energy companies as well so our slogan and the call for justice can't be empty it actually means having a radical anti-colonial lens to look at this crisis now and uh, and the idea that we can continue to be saying push for incremental change or be pragmatic it's not simply possible it's not possible from the science it's not not possible from the lived experience of our communities and it's not possible in the face of these multiple crises and these last 50 years have shown us how deadly that approach has, has, has been so we need a movement to movement approach not so that we're big, bigger than our individual some parts and that means a fundamental change of our theory of change to one that recognizes the most important thing is how do we build our movements how do we build power how do we engage in a, in a strategy of struggle and i want to say look around the world in chile the cradle of neoliberalism is now the graveyard of neoliberalism in india 250 million farmers defeated the fascist government over handing over the control of food our partners in sri lanka uh, have been on the streets fighting for the right to food and living wages and the and the government of sri lanka has now fallen the reality is everywhere people are saying we want something different now is our chance to be able to connect these movements to be able to tell a very very different story because change is happening uh, i'm going to end now the change is happening. The IPCC, it's inevitable. The only question now is what kind of change, who will benefit and who will be sacrificed?